Strauss and Mahler, the titans of Austro-German music, spent the afternoon in the hills above the city, as Alma Mahler recounted in her memoirs. The photographer captured the composers outside the opera house, apparently preparing to set out on their expedition, Strauss smiling in a boater hat, Mahler squinting in the sun. The company visited a waterfall and had lunch in an inn, where they sat at a plain wooden table. They must have made a strange pair, Strauss, tall and lanky, with a bulbous forehead, a weak chin, strong but sunken eyes. Mahler, a full head shorter, a muscular hawk of a man. As the sun began to go down, Mahler became nervous about the time and suggested that the party head back to the Hotel Elephant, where they were staying, to prepare for the performance. They can't start without me, Strauss said. Let them wait. Mahler replied, If you won't go, then I will, and conduct in your place. Mahler was forty-six, Strauss forty-one. They were in most respects polar opposites. Mahler was a kaleidoscope of moods, childlike, heaven-storming, despotic, despairing. In Vienna, as he strode from his apartment near the Schwarzenbergplatz to the opera house on the Ringstrasse, cab drivers would whisper to their passengers, "Der Mahler. Strauss was earthy, self-satisfied, more than a little cynical, a closed book to most observers. The soprano Gemma Bellinconi, who sat next to him at a banquet after the performance in Graz, described him as a pure kind of German, without poses, without long-winded speeches, little gossip, and no inclination to talk about himself and his work, a gaze of steel, an indecipherable expression. Strauss came from Munich, a backward place in the eyes of sophisticated Viennese, such as Gustav and Alma. Alma underlined this impression in her memoir by rendering Strauss's dialogue in an exaggerated Bavarian dialect. Not surprisingly, the relationship between the two composers suffered from frequent misunderstandings. Mahler would recoil from unintended slights. Strauss would puzzle over the sudden silences that ensued. Strauss was still trying to understand his old colleague some four decades later when he read Alma's book and annotated it. All untrue he wrote, next to the description of his behavior in Graz. Strauss and I tunnel from opposite sides of the mountain, Mahler said. One day we shall meet. Both saw music as a medium of conflict, a battlefield of extremes. They reveled in the tremendous sounds that a hundred-piece orchestra could make, yet they also released energies of fragmentation and collapse. The heroic narratives of nineteenth-century romanticism from Beethoven's symphonies to Wagner's music dramas, invariably ended with a blaze of transcendence, of spiritual overcoming. Mahler and Strauss told stories of more circuitous shape, often questioning the possibility of a truly happy outcome. 